Welcome back students to Chemistry 2620 video notes. We're going to pick up where we left off in chapter uh, 24 with um, carbohydrates. So let's talk about some um, cyclic monosaccharides. So when we look at things like uh, this aldehyde here, Let's remember that from a prior chapter, we could see that aldehydes reacted with alcohols in the presence of an acid catalyst, and what they formed was something called a hemiacetal. So in this structure, you have the aldehyde here, and you have an alcohol here. So let's highlight these different colors. So let's start with this oxygen being a bright green, and then let's make this oxygen a purple. During the course of this reaction, your <clears throat> oxygen that is uh, highlighted in purple ends up being over here on the outside of the ring. So here's my purple one again, and then let's go back and highlight the green one again. So here's the green one, and then here's the green one. So what happens is your pair of electrons on the oxygen, one of those pairs, ends up attacking the carbon of the carbonyl right, and then opens that up. So the green oxygen ends up becoming part of the ring and then the oxygen that was part of the carbonyl ends up being on the outside of the ring. Notice how you have some acid catalyst which is um, why you see this process being protonated. And when you look at um, this process. This is called a hemiacetal. Hemi is half and an acetal, if you remember, um, I think the one that you probably got most familiar with looked like this because we used it as a protecting group. So this one was a full cyclic acetal where your ring had two oxygens in it. But this one's a hemiacetal because you only have one oxygen in the ring, and then you have an OH group external to the ring. This carbon right here is a pretty important one. This carbon we call the anomeric carbon. As we start to look at compounds of monosaccharides that are more complex than this one, what we'll find is that there is the ability to have different configurations around this carbon, the anomeric one. And what I mean by configurations is, you know, like R and S, you can have different configurations depending upon which uh, direction that OH is pointing. So let's just write down here that this is an anomeric carbon. Sometimes, um, students kind of lose sight of which carbon is the anomeric carbon once we start getting to more complex examples like this one. So let's take a moment in our simpler example to figure out why the carbon that I've circled in blue is the anomeric carbon. So during the course of the reaction, this carbon of the carbonyl was the one that ends up being the blue circle over here, the anomeric carbon. So the carbon where the alcohol ends up attacking, that carbon that bears the carbonyl group, that's gonna be your anomeric carbon. It's the carbon of the that kind of links and creates that uh, hemiacetal. It connects those two um, used to be different functional groups that are now all together in the cyclic hemiacetal. So when we look at an actual sugar like this one here, notice how uh, we have again an aldehyde group, we have an alcohol group. If we kind of draw the open form, and the open form means it's not cyclic, in a way where it's starting to look like it's gonna be cyclic, because remember all those bonds are capable of rotating, then remember this is gonna happen, and so the OH is coming from this O of the carbonyl oxygen, and where we're numbering number one right here, that's your anomeric carbon. And the direction of the circled OH 
ends up creating a possible two different enantiomers. If your direction of your OH is pointing up, that's going to be one enantiomer. If your OH was pointing down here or on this side or that face, then you would end up having the other enantiomer. So this carbon number one, your anomeric carbon, is a chiral center and that chiral center can lead to um, a pair of enantiomers. So uh, when we look at um, these two enantiomers that would form, they have a name uh, when you look at a pair of enantiomers uh, that differ based upon the anomeric carbon. And the name for enantiomers that are differing on their configuration of the anomeric carbon are called anomers. So uh, they do show how different anomers are formed in the Klein textbook. Um, if you want to go look that up, I think it's going to be right around page 1080 maybe about there. That's a guess because I didn't bring the book with me. Um, so again, anomers are when you have a pair of enantiomers that uh, differ in configuration at the anomeric carbon. Ooh, just fit that in. So let's look at some more uh, cyclic hemiacetals. So when we look at um, this one, it's a repeat of the uh, cyclic hemiacetal that was on the bottom of the prior page. And this right here is called a Hayworth projection. Now, even though you're going to see in biology textbooks, probably, um, the Hayworth projection most commonly drawn, what really occurs in real life is more like this, right? It's the um, chair conformation of D-glucose, and this one in particular is D-glucose. So the chair conformation is how things really look in real life, but Hayworth projections are going to be how you end up seeing them drawn, right? So this is going to be the true nature of your six-membered ring. It's going to look a heck of a lot more like a chair conformation. So just keep in mind that um, your things like glucose are not the only things that can form hemiacetals. Um, Six-membered rings and five-membered rings are quite stable in nature. And so if we have uh, something like this as our starting material, this is also capable of forming a cyclic hemiacetal, even though there's only four carbons, because remember the oxygen is going to be in part of uh, the ring, and so your oxygen's your fifth member in the ring. And so this one is called a furanose ring. And it's just a different cyclic hemiacetal. Again, the carbon that was the carbonyl carbon is going to be your number one. And you would still end up with a set of anomers if you changed the OH down to this position. And you'd end up with two enantiomers where the enantiomers differed at the anomeric carbon, which is what we call anomers. So in this next section, we're going to look at two reactions of monosaccharides. So when we look at these two reactions, one of the things that needs to be clarified are these are not reactions that are happening in the body. These two reactions are things that are happening outside of the body. So this would be like if you're a biochemist and you want to change uh, the structure of 
a monosaccharide and to see how it behaves, then you would have this outside of the body. You would add these things. Um, so this is just to help illustrate that no matter if we're talking about a monosaccharide or any other alcohol, the monosaccharides are going to do all of the same uh, reactions that alcohols have done in our prior chapters. So here's two examples. If we take something like this uh, glucopyranose and we add excess acetic anhydride, so see how over here it says AC is this function and then it tells you that there's an O and it tells you that there's two ACs. That means acetic anhydride looks like this. Remember PY is a base of pyridine. And so if you add acetic anhydride, then you're going to get an acetate or yeah, I guess an acetate group on every one of those oxygens. Then if we do something a little bit different, and uh, we end up um, adding a alkyl halide with some of that silver oxide catalyst, uh, we can see a replacement reaction here as well, a substitution reaction. And notice how it's not selective. It hits every one of those OHs and turns it into a methyl. So these reactions that you have learned of alcohols during the course of prior chapters are still going to be applicable uh, to monosaccharides. So let's look at disaccharides. For disaccharides, these are two monosaccharides that are joined together. When we look at these monosaccharides, what is going to happen is we're going to have um, these linkages between the two monosaccharides to make a disaccharide. The 1,4 linkage is going to be the most common one. And the 1,4 linkage starts at number one, the anomeric carbon. And then the fourth position of another monosaccharide. So at the fourth position, we're seeing a um, linkage happening at the uh, OH on the fourth position of another monosaccharide. So we get the number four by starting to count uh, the number one of the anomeric carbon at the second monosaccharide. So let me show you what I mean by that. If we look at this first set of monosaccharides, where your oxygen is here, this carbon is your anomeric carbon. And so see how we're forming a bond here at that first position. Well, in our second monosaccharide, this is your anomeric carbon right here. So this is one, which makes this two, which makes this three, which makes this one four. So at that fourth position, there was an OH group and that uh, OH group is now connected to the first position of the other monosaccharide. So we're only gonna actually look at two types of one four linkages because there are only two types. And so let's take a look at the difference between them. When we look at uh, this alpha linkage here, we have kind of this pattern versus a beta linkage, which has this pattern. So if we start to try to inspect that pattern, let's look at the alpha linkage first. The alpha linkage at the first carbon, so at the first carbon, it appears that you essentially have like an axial position. And the fourth carbon, you look like you have an equatorial position. That's awful. I was trying to make that look prettier and it didn't work. That's better. When we look at the beta linkage, 
your first carbon has an equatorial position and your fourth carbon on the other structure also has an equatorial. So you can see that the axial and equatorial type um, directions here end up really um, having quite a difference. Look at even just the bond angle, right? This one's quite broad and this is quite a sharp angle. So if we look at another one, another beta linkage, this is a beta linkage that's happening between two different monosaccharides. And so we still see the same thing though, because it's a beta linkage that we're seeing an equatorial type bond, an equatorial type position. And so we see that beta linkage. There is another type of linkage, and that is a 1-2 linkage that we're seeing here between glucose and fructose, which happens to make your fave sucrose. And so this is a 1-2 linkage because we're connecting your uh, first position here with your second position here. So let's go ahead and look at polysaccharides. On the next page. So for polysaccharides, this is really going to be a great place where those alpha and beta linkages really come to life. So cellulose and starch are things that we deal with daily, right? We are always consuming these. And so they're both made up of glucose, but they behave different in our bodies. So cellulose would be um, like your your fiber, right? And your starch would uh, be something that your body can digest, but your body can't digest cellulose. It can't digest that fiber and that plant structure. And so why, if they're both made up of glucose units, why can our body digest one and not the other? And I'm going to change this question here. Why can we eat starch but not cellulose? We can eat cellulose. Uh, it just our body won't digest it. So why can we digest starch but not cellulose? And so let's take a look at the difference in those polymer chains. So for cellulose here, let's take notice that we have a beta linkage. So... Here we have those two equatorial type bonds. In our starch, we have an alpha linkage. So we have that axial position and that equatorial position. So it turns out that we're capable and we have the enzymes. Mama, 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 mama. <laughs> So we have the enzyme to digest starch, to break apart that beta linkage. But we don't have an enzyme. Oh wait, I said that backwards. We have the enzyme to digest starch, the alpha linkage. But we don't have the enzyme to digest cellulose, which has that beta linkage. It is really interesting though that cows, for example, are meant and supposed to naturally eat grass, which is just full of cellulose. But remember, they have a special set of stomachs for that, right? So they have something called a rumen. I'm not sure if I'm spelling that correctly. And so they have a series of four stomachs that will um, work through that process. And they must also have an enzyme that um, can take beta linkages and uh, break them apart to get that glucose to be free so that they can consume it and use it in their bodily systems. Okay, so let's pause here. We'll come back with one more video to wrap up chapter 24. Uh, as always, thank you for your attention. This is Katoni signing out.